Um, before this video starts, I would like to briefly address the video I made before this video, uh, which received a lot more attention than I was expecting. I had less than 30 subscribers when that video was published, and now I have over 300, so, so thank you very much. Some of the comments on that video are really sweet, and it just makes my day to read them, so, so I'd, I'd very much like to thank those people. I am also going to go back to school soon, so videos might slow down somewhat from the already snail's pace that they come out at. Um, but honestly, I love making videos, and I'm going to make them as as fast as I possibly can. So, I hope you stick around, um, and even if you only came around once just to see that video, I really appreciate it. So, thank you. Micronations are some of the most fascinating geographical elements on Earth. Whether you think of the sphere-shaped Republic of Kugelmoogle, or the chaotic state of the self-declared smallest country, Sealand, these places often have fascinating stories. However, the people, motives, planning, and intricacy of one particular micronation in the 1960s and 70s are perhaps the most interesting yet. This is the story of Operation Atlantis. Werner K. Stiefel was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1921. His family had established a soap and candle manufacturing business in the German city of Offenbach before his birth, but were forced to flee to the USA by the Nazis, leaving the company behind. Werner followed a similar path to his family, graduating from Yale University in 1942 with a degree in chemical engineering. He used this to found the dermatological company today called Stiefel Laboratories, which garnered him extensive wealth. His inspiration to create a micronation came from Russian-American author and philosopher Ayn Rand's 1957 novel Atlas Shrugged, which sees a group of American businessmen take shelter in the Colorado mountains, whilst the remainder of America collapses under a socialist dictatorship. Despite being fictional in nature, the book's political slant, including aspects such as the aforementioned plotline and Rand's extensive demonstration of her philosophical system, Objectivism, was the key inspiration for Stiefel. Atlas Shrugged has gained prevalence among libertarian thinkers for this reason, of which Stiefel could easily be considered a part of. He believed that the real-world post-war America was on a similar road to enterprise-choking socialism as portrayed in the novel. In accordance, Stiefel sought to, quote, test the hypothesis that a free capitalist society can exist and flourish in today's world, unquote, through the construction of a physical nation, as well as improve upon Rand's philosophy. Operation Atlantis was thus created. Stiefel split his plan for Operation Atlantis into three parts. In Atlantis I, he would gather like-minded libertarians in a single location to create an integrated community, which would continue the later stages. Atlantis II involved acquiring an ocean vessel and declaring it an independent craft, in order to travel to the desired location for Atlantis III, a confirmed area of land that would become their sovereign country, as close to American shores as geography and law would allow. Atlantis I began in 1968. Stiefel started by establishing the Atlantis Development Company, under which he would purchase the land for Atlantis III and various other necessary items. He operated this company out of the Sawyer Kill Motel, an establishment nearby one of his soap-making factories in Saugateries, New York. Stiefel purchased the motel and few acres of land with it as a place for his libertarian recruits to live together and collaborate on the project although not before renaming it the Atlantis Sawyer Kill Motel. Those who worked on the project part-time were offered free lodging, and the remaining rooms were rented out to guests like a normal motel, in order to create revenue for the Atlantis Development Company. Atlantis One's first recruit came by way of a man named Phil Coates, a fellow follower of Ayn Rand and recently hired to work for Stiefel's pharmaceutical company. The second was writer Roy Halliday, who had discovered the project by way of one of the many libertarian magazines he was subscribed to at the time. Stiefel's promotion of Atlantis One did not end there, however, going on to write and self-publish a 32-page book entitled The Story of Operation Atlantis, under the pseudonym Warren K. Stevens. The book detailed the three-step plan and encouraged libertarians to assist with its acceleration, describing the project's intention to become a, quote, ideally free utopia. Unquote. Publication of a newsletter entitled Atlantis News also began in September of the same year, 
giving monthly updates on the project and plans for the future. Freedom forums were also held in the motel's lobby, where residents, guest speakers, and drop-in visitors contributed their ideas to the project. Whilst those who left first-hand accounts of their experience at Atlantis 1 often did not attend these meetings, it is known that topics range from the nation's economics to informing and interviewing potential members. Atlantis 1 served not only to culminate members, but also to test what Stiefel called the Atlantis concept, which allowed residents to, quote, concurrently evolve and live under Atlantis law, to the extent that it does not conflict with American law, unquote. Atlantis 1 was also used to flesh out the later stages, particularly in deciding on a location for Atlantis 3 and constructing the boat for Atlantis 2. Various other emerging micronations at the time had come into legal conflict when attempting to acquire land, so Stiefel adapted to suit this climate by instituting Atlantis 1A, an extra step. In March of 1969, Stiefel travelled to the Caribbean to find a suitable location for Atlantis 3. By summer, the Atlantis News denounced a promising location known as the Prickly Pear Keys, a pair of small uninhabited islands near Anguilla. Not wishing to draw legal conflict or media attention, Stiefel requested to purchase 157 acres of the land from the Anguillan government, to which they declined. In 1970, unable to use the Prickly Pear Keys, Stiefel and the other residents agreed with utilising the Silver Shoal Keys, the ownership of which is disputed between the Bahamas and Haiti. Their plans described that this new location would be the site for constructing a shoal landfill and habitable sea platform. Atlantis II was where the execution became more difficult, and more challenges presented themselves. Satisfied with the location choice, the dozen or so core members were now tasked with constructing the Faro cement boat which would transport them there, and then serve as temporary shelter during Atlantis III's construction. Faro cement, a combination of wire meshes and cement mortar, was the material used to construct the vessel, due to it being inexpensive and relatively easy to use. Its use was also inspired by the rapid technological growth of the 60s and 70s, frequently utilised by various other developing micronations. Coins also began to be minted, named the Decker, as well as that an issue of the Atlantis News published in November of 1970 announced that the Atlantis Development Corporation had obtained a licence to construct a 7 metre high, 15 metre diameter geodesic dome on the motel grounds, which would house the construction of the boat. Building the 12 metre ship took the group a full year and the aid of independent contractors, but it was eventually completed in December of 1971. However, it was also at this point that things began to go downhill. The boat launched at high tide on the Hudson River that same month. The team prompted them the knowledge that the river would imminently freeze over for the winter. When the tide went back out again, the boat fell on its side, causing a kerosene lamp in its wheelhouse to break. The fire which was caused by this was small, and caused only repairable damage. However, a concrete deck house which was added to the vessel during these repairs caused the boat to become extremely top-heavy, and, in combination with superstructure icing, the vessel almost capsized again while leaving the New York Harbour. A propeller shaft later broke off the coast of South Carolina, but the vessel was close enough to ensure the Bahamas could still be reached by this point. The eventual anchoring point was near an island known as Acklands, where the ship promptly sunk after having its hull destroyed in a hurricane. However, Stiefel and his followers still insisted on pursuing Atlantis III. In response to the sinking of the original Atlantis II, Stiefel acquired a new boat, and continued on to Silver Shoals. His group constructed four sea walls and began to dredge sand in order to create artificial land. The area is also rife with Spanish sea wrecks, and several nuggets of silver were retrieved from one of these shipwrecks upon the Operation Atlantis team's arrival. However, the area is also rife with seafaring pirates, so these nuggets were given to Haiti's president at the time, François Duvalier, in exchange for protection from these pirates. However, the Atlantis III construction site was later discovered by a Haitian gunboat. Not knowing their purpose for being on the island, the Operation Atlantis devotees were mistaken for thieves, with the gunboat threatening to open fire if they did not leave immediately. The group was forced to retreat. To avoid any similar incidents from occurring in the future, Stiefel took out a long-term lease 
for a base on Tortuga Island from the Haitian government, which was excessively far right at the time. Therefore, when one of the government's officials discovered a copy of the Atlantis News and learned of Stiefel's true motivations, the lease was promptly cancelled and the location of Atlantis III was again forced to change. Although Stiefel still had hope in his polity, the majority of the original members had left the group to return to the United States by this point. Stiefel attempted to revive the project by creating land on the Mysteriosa Bank, a submerged atoll between Cuba and Honduras. He managed to acquire an oil tanker as an equivalent to Atlantis II, but this was again blown away and destroyed by a hurricane before any construction on the land was commenced. Stiefel, still undeterred, again attempted to acquire an island to call his own, albeit without the use of boats. It is reported that he purchased property on the Grand Cayman, the largest of the three Cayman Islands. This venture was relatively successful, with the purchase complex utilized as an office of the Atlantis Trading and Commodity Purchasing Service, which later became the Bank of Atlantis, and continued to mint the Decker. However, it was still a far cry from Operation Atlantis' original intentions. While at this property, Stiefel turned his attention to the government of Belize, from which he purchased a small island with the intent of receiving freeport status from the government. Whether this was ever received is unknown, and Stiefel put the island up for sale due to waning interest in the land. The project manager of the original Operation Atlantis, Barry Reed, purchased a six-acre island named Hatchet Key, where he, Stiefel, and the few remaining members reportedly lived until 2005, when Stiefel was diagnosed with cancer. Stiefel died in June of the following year, taking his ideas and motivation with him. His company, Stiefel Laboratories, remains the largest privately owned dermatological company in the world, with over 2,500 employees. The Atlanta Sawyer Kill Motel has been completely abandoned, but also listed for sale, and seems to have been purchased by an anonymous buyer. Stiefel's deliberate intention to keep a low profile and small core membership have caused the Operation Atlantis project to fade into relative obscurity, leaving the remarkable story and fate of various pieces of land purchased throughout its lifespan unknown. While ocean colonization projects of similar concept have since been formulated, perhaps none will reach the same level of persistence and intent as Operation Atlantis. <laughs>